people often focus on the fact that salvation gives us the opportunity to walk with God for eternity and rightly so because that is the most incredible thing but there are so many other blessings that we receive the very moment we give our lives to Christ and that is what this series is going to continue focusing on as we continue to move into 2021. So today, as has been said, we are going to learn about the freedom to love. Now it isn't a surprise that we are focusing on love in February when a lot of countries celebrate Valentine's Day, the holiday of love. And I'll admit that's why we went there this month, but I love God's planning. He always puts everything in perfect order when we go to him with our planning. And because love, he gave us love, and love is the linchpin of all the blessings we receive from God. So it's actually the perfect place to start. We as Christians are given the freedom to love because God's love 
is holy and his justice is righteous. So let's break that up. What do we know about God's holy love? Well, we know that God is love, that he doesn't just showcase love, that he exudes love. Everything he does permeates his love. Everything he says, everything he does, everything he creates is his love. And his love is perfect, and it's good. In his perfection, God has chosen to love us despite our sins, despite our flaws, despite the fact that we turn and walk away from him in disobedience. He loves us perfectly. And God's love is perfectly crafted for each individual specifically, including you and me. God's love knows no bounds. It reaches out even to his enemies. And God's love for us is completely unmerited. It's undeserved and it's unrelenting. There is nothing that we can do to keep God from loving us. And God's love is purposeful. It's meant to bring us closer to him and allow us to get to know him better and more intimately and to grant us the freedom to love others. The freedom that God's love grants us to love others, while a gift to us, still requires cultivation on our part. We are products of a culture. That is simply a fact we cannot deny. And while the culture of the world is becoming increasingly more godless and more and more lacking in love, we as Christians must intentionally submerge ourselves in God's culture instead of the world's culture. In God's culture, we are free to resist the attributes of Christ. We're free to love, to stand up for God's ideals and carry the fruit that he asks us to bear. And to do so, we must be conscious that we aren't allowing ourselves to be swept along by the world's culture and the world's ideals. We are being molded, but as Christians, we are free to choose what it is that molds us. We're free to turn away from a world of anger and hate and judgment. We are free to love. God's boundless love gives us the freedom to love without bounds. The world tells us to love those who are like us and to protect ourselves from those with different views or different upbringings or even different gods or moral codes. But as Christians, God gives us the freedom to love those who aren't like us because we are under the protection of the one holy, true God. And he's the one who can protect us and can provide for us. Over and over, Jesus reached out to those who were unclean, to those who were from different cultures, to those who were considered to be enemies of God's chosen people. He reached out to those whose lives were drenched in sin of prostitution, and to those who were traitors to the Jews by the virtue of their very profession. Jesus told us in John 15, 9 through 12, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as, as I have obeyed my Father's commands and I remain in his love. I have told you this so that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other 
as I have loved you. We are told to love. And we are free to love because our God is sovereign and he is in control. If we refuse to love based on the idea that we need to protect ourselves, then we're committing a sin of unbelief. And we must pray for God to increase our faith that we would trust in his protection. God's unconditional love for us gives us freedom to love ourselves despite our own shortcomings. It's easy to condemn ourselves, especially as women. We have all done things that we're ashamed of and regret, but God's love for us gives us the freedom to love ourselves and to start again. Galatians 2.20 tells us, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. If God loved me and you, fully knowing our sins, and his love is perfect, we are called to live in his perfect love and to love ourselves as well. God's holy love teaches us to freely love others who do not or cannot offer their love to us in return. God doesn't stop loving those who don't love him back, and neither should we. Matthew 5, 46 and 48 says, If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So besides the fact that we can lean on God's love, we as Christians are free to love because we can rely on God's perfect justice. Only God has the authority and the power to judge and sentence. God loves righteousness and he hates iniquity and we know that he will always judge fairly. God is all-knowing and his judgment will never be swayed by outside forces. Romans 2, 6 through 11 tells us, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and mortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. God does not show favoritism. Because we trust that God is the judge, we are free to love and leave the judgment to God. Have you ever thought about the fact that we're very aware of our own shortcomings or the shortcomings of others, and but we often are aware of our own, but we justify our own shortcomings. I personally tend to judge other people harshly, and but I make excuses for my own issues because I know the whole story surrounding my own missteps. Jesus warns us about this in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. He says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. I don't want to be called that by God. 
First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So if love is a gift that must be cultivated, we would be remiss to not take a few minutes to examine how we can love better. First, to love better, we must look at others. And we must work to understand them and their motives and their stories. Everyone has a story. And in this busy world, we tend to judge before we understand. People long to be seen. They long to be heard. When someone does something that causes you to judge, Pastor Rick Warren says, instead of asking yourself, what are they thinking? Instead ask, what have they been through? We as Christians have the added benefit to petition God to soften our hearts and to give to, that he would give us wisdom as to how to best, how we can best show compassion to others. Matthew tells us that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Always look to the heart of the individual. To do this, you may need to pay attention to the next tip. To love better, you need to humble yourself. How much time do you devote to loving others? We are selfish by nature and we must continually ask God to give us eyes to see the needs of others and the willingness to set aside our own agendas to meet those needs. And we need to look at ourselves objectively. When we do, we'll likely see the mess that we are, which somehow takes us off the pedestal that the world tells us to climb on. When my daughters were young, one was a figure skater and one was a gymnast, and my family spent every day going between the skating rink and the gym. And no matter what competition we went to, somebody was getting up on a pedestal and getting a medal. And I'll never forget one day, my uh, two-year-old son, I have a picture of this, it's so sweet. My t I was talking to some friends and my two-year-old son climbed up on the pedestal. And uh, I looked over and he's just standing there smiling with a little self, a little efficient grin, self-satisfied. The world tells us from a young age to do everything we can to get to the top of that pedestal, to make ourselves better than everyone else. God tells us to come down. He tells us to meet people where they are and to cheer them on and to even help them climb onto their own pedestal. That's love. Third, to love better, we must be open to God's leading in our lives. Loving often means giving away control of our schedule, our time, even our money. But we have that freedom as Christians because we know that God is in perfect control. And he will honor the love that we give. He will give us, he will take care of us. He will provide our schedules, our time. He will provide the money that we give to people freely. When he tells us to love, we can love freely because God is our perfect provider and he will never let us down. Fourth, to love better, we must focus on compassion rather than legalism. This is a hard one for me. I am a rule follower. But the problem is that legalism showcases what we do and it ignores who we are. 
Legalism makes me look good without seeing my motives. It encourages me to be in a specific mold in public, but it masks who I am in private. Jesus said, as written in Mark 7:15, nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Like I said, this is hard for me, so I want to share a bit of encouragement. If you focus on compassion and ask God to give you a compassionate heart, he will. One of my pet peeves is being cut off in traffic. I, I'm a safe driver, and uh, I always leave quite a bit of space of a room in front of me. I, my dad was a patrol, an ex-highway patrolman, and uh, I am a rule follower, so of course. But if someone cuts me off in traffic, I get mad. And if they cut me off twice, <laughs> well, I have to fight frustration and have been known to think non-Christian thoughts, we'll just say. <laughs> anyway, as I have been preparing this teaching, as I always do, I ask God to show me what he wants me to teach and he he showed me that he wanted me to teach to ask him for compassion and so I did and next thing I knew I was driving my son to school and uh, I got cut off not once but twice and you know then I realized a split second later I was saying a silent prayer to God praying for the person who cut me off asking that God would protect that individual wherever he or she was going and that he would let him or her have a better day. <laughs> so if you know me, you know that that was the gift of the Spirit because it sure didn't come from me. <laughs> Finally, to love better, we must, when appropriate, speak the truth in love. Loving someone means being honest with them in the right atmosphere at the right time. We all have circles of relationships that ripple out. Our inner circle includes those whom we trust and have given permission to speak into our lives. A spouse, a coworker in ministry, a best friend or a parent, child, older child relationship. Each of us has a responsibility to love well within that inner circle and that includes giving honest feedback both giving and receiving that feedback we all have blind spots <laughs> and god put us on this earth together to hold each other up and to hold each other accountable there are times we all need feedback from someone who loves us that can see our lives from a slightly different angle than we do. Not allowing this puts us in danger of walking down a self-righteous, lonely path that only leads us away from God and all that he has for us. Another time it is appropriate to speak the truth in love is when someone has wronged you directly. Jesus says in Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. I encourage you to use caution here. and Don't take this command as permission to go ranting to someone you are angry with. Every truth must be spoken with compassion. Amen. Take your time, be specific, and use the conversation as a catalyst, bringing both of you more into God's presence. Amen. Our mission must always be to care for others in love and to lift them up, not push them down. Remember, God is the judge. And though God may at times use us to help grow someone else, our purpose is to love. 
If we cannot approach someone with love and compassion alongside the truth that we feel should be revealed, we're better off keeping quiet. We as Christians are given the freedom to love because we serve a God whose love is holy and whose justice is righteous. God has freed us to love. He's taken the burden of judgment, justice, and punishment. And he does so perfectly, allowing us to simply love. That's our job. Sounds easy. It isn't always. <laughs> to experience true freedom in love, we must place our faith in God and cultivate the love that he is growing in our hearts. We must put our faith in God's protection as we love individuals outside of our normal bounds, even when the prospect of that kind of love goes against everything society tells us is safe or smart. We must put our faith in God's wisdom as we love ourselves and others who can't or won't love us back unconditionally, just as God loves us unconditionally. We must put our schedules in God's hands as we slow down, as we look at others and we listen to their stories. We must have faith in God's provision as we open ourselves up to God's leading as he positions us to love through our serving and through our giving. We must trust God's justice as we put compassion over legalism. And we must rely on God's wisdom as we speak truth soaked in compassion to those who have hurt us directly or to those who are in our inner circle who we need to hold accountable. We as Christians are standing on the beach, a very windy beach tonight. <laughs> We're watching the sun rise in all its glory. The view is breathtaking, filling every cell of our being, but there is so much we've yet to see. God has an ocean worth of blessings just waiting for us as we learn to love as he loves. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, Now we see, but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Let's keep striving. Let's keep loving. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of love. We thank you for taking the hard part of justice, of judgment, protection, provision, wisdom, and leaving us with love. That's our job. Help us love well. Help us depend on you for the rest. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.